Good morning. It's so good to be back. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Father, you have so much to say to us through this chapter in Zechariah because, God, we, we all have faced mountains in our lives, just things that we just feel like I can't, I just can't do it. I don't have what it takes. And, and Lord, you've inspired us sometimes to get going, and we get going, and we fall on our faces again. And uh, God, thank you for what you have to say to us through Zechariah, Lord, that uh, we can do all things. We can hit those mountains that you, but it's you, Lord, that make the mountains plains. It's not us. It's by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, would you uh, inspire us and encourage us, uh, and may we get what you want to say to us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. So this morning, I kind of have the opportunity to walk this lesson because our plane was delayed last night and we got in at 12.30, which is 3.30 New York time. And I thought my message was ready to go. And when I pulled it out this morning, it wasn't quite as ready to go as I thought it was. And so, you know, it was the, I felt like Zachariah, you know, and Zerubbabel and Joshua, you know, I can't do this. I don't have enough time. It's not going to happen. And, and, uh, and yet he pulled it together, and I, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty much on top of it. You'll be able to find out that um, pretty soon, but, but he is just so good. You know, when he says, not by your might or power, but by my spirit, he means that for, for each one of us. The last book that we studied was Haggai, and I, I missed that. Kristen taught you and Appley taught you, and the, the book of Haggai begins with the words, uh, in 1-1, one, one. in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month of the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of, and Christian said that really well, and I'm not even going to try, um, the governor, leader of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, so we have Haggai starting out like that, and, and just to remind you, you see Haggai and Zechariah right underneath each other because what we see Zechariah begins with, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying. So we'll see, especially in chapters three and four, that Zechariah too would have words for Zerubbabel and Joshua. Haggai prophesied until the ninth month of the second year of Darius. So their prophecies overlapped. The name Darius might be familiar to you. Darius was a king who threw Daniel into the lion's den. So during his reign, we see that Haggai and Zechariah are prophesying to the Jews that had been allowed to return to Jerusalem. Now, Haggai's prophecy was geared to giving the Jews a boot. You know, get back to rebuilding the temple. Remember, they, they had their priorities all off. And because of opposition, opposition, the building had ceased for 15, 20 years. Unless we think that God was only interested in rebuild my temple, we have the book of Zechariah. And in Zechariah, there are eight visions geared to be an encouragement to the building with the emphasis of God's concern, not just for the building, but for the spiritual condition of the people that would be doing the building. Christian gave you and, and Apley gave you a sense of, of what was going on, the on at the time and left us as Haggai left the Jews with a sense of conviction about their priorities. You know, you live in these paneled houses, you know, but, but his house, God's house, was not being built, and, and the conviction for you and for me that what are our priorities when the work of God is not being done and he's called us individually in different parts of God's work. Last week I was at East Coast Pastor's Wives Retreat. Pretty much all the pastor's wives from Midwest to 
the Eastern Coast go to that particular retreat. And I got to teach on rightly dividing the word of God. And my goal was to encourage these pastors' wives that, that you can do this. Because sadly, what they get exposed to at these huge conferences is people that have been doing a lot of teaching like me. And, and then they sit there and think, how could I ever teach like that? You know. And so one thing that I did when I was teaching, I, I asked every member of the national board that, that I'm part of, I said, send me one page of your notes. Because I'm going to put them up on the PowerPoint. I'm going to let the ladies see what a mess our notes are. And, and they really did get the impression of when they were looking at, at different sets of notes for each of us, like, I could do that. You know, anybody could make a mess of notes like that. And I remember one June Hesterly sent me this really nice, clean sheet of notes, and I texted her back, and I said, that is not what you teach from. And so she sent me another one with lines crossed out and messages on the side. And sometimes we write things on the side, and then, you know, when I'm teaching, I'll look at it and think, what was I trying to say, you know? But you can't stare at your notes that long, and so you just muffle through it. And so my goal was just to encourage them that, you know, they're pastor's wives, you know, and they've got ladies that need to be taught the word. And, and you know, not all pastor's wives are called to teach Bible studies, but a lot are, and to encourage them to do that. And they, they would come, come to me afterwards, and, and it was like, I know I can do that now. And that's kind of where Haggai leaves us to, okay, I, I know I can do it. But then the problem is, is we start kind of thinking in our own flesh, and Kristen was a little bit ahead there and realizing she knows we can't do it in our flesh. But first there's that inspiration that has to come of, of God saying, you know, get up and do this work. And we're, and we're like, yes, I can do this. And that very often is when we fall on our face, isn't it? Because we find out, I can't. And so Zechariah is that part two. His message was meant to encourage, but he was well aware that not all of that returned remnant was fully sincere in their desires to serve the Lord. I mean, remember where they came from. These were a people whose, some of the people and, and whose fathers had been taken from captivity. They hadn't been walking with the Lord for a long time. And then they're taken into a captivity of a heathen country, not really allowed to serve the Lord as they would like to. And then they're taken back into their country, and it's like, all right, now be spiritual again. Now have a relationship with the Lord again. And it's like, how do you do that? They haven't been able to do that in, in so long. It might be what you and I would be like after we hadn't been to church or Bible studies for a while, you know? And, and it hits us very, very quickly, doesn't it? So the, the first part of God's message to the Jews was Zechariah 1, 3. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts, Lord of hosts, Lord of hosts. Lord of all principalities and powers. Lord of everything that's going to come against you. I love that he said it three times. Come back. See, not only to the land, but to the Lord of the land. And his promise, he would return to them. He would be their God again. Remember when we studied in the book of Ezekiel and the glory of the Lord left, departed from the temple, his covering, his blessings were no longer to be had, and it had been a long time, and God was saying, return to me and I'll come back. My presence will come back. My blessings will come back. So through Zechariah, God first told the people to return to him. Then he instructed them to build the temple. Before good works, see, God always wants faith and relationship. Their fathers had taught the sacrifices were most important. And God did not want that thinking to rise up again. Sacrifices were to be a response to their relationship with him. And so this morning, I want to focus on the third and fourth of the eight visions of Zechariah. The, the fourth is in chapter four, the vision of the lampstand. But it's important that we take some time to look at the third vision in chapter three. 
chapter 3 was to be directed to Joshua, the priest. And then one vision in chapter 4 was to be directed to Zerubbabel, the civic leader, the governor. One vision, chapter 3, addressed the need to be cleansed. And the other vision, chapter 4, addressed the need to be empowered. And see, when we step forward in God's work, we've got to be cleansed and be empowered. So before we dive into the message of the need to be empowered, we've got to first look at that need to be cleansed in our lives. And the more that I walk with the Lord, the more that I see that we shouldn't seek the power if we haven't sought the cleansing. And for many months, you've, you've heard me talk about this desire that I have for revival that I've never really had before, not this intensely. I want to see God move. I want to see him save souls. I want to see him fire us up and change lives. And I want to see people excited about him again. And when I was in, in Branson, Missouri, a few weekends ago, one Friday night we sang a song that, that I found myself just singing over and over and over again the next day. And the lyrics go like this, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. And, and that's a great desire, but as I sang that song and I got ready to teach Saturday night, I realized that song's not scriptural. Because God's never going to set a fire in your soul or mind that we can't control. And isn't that what people are afraid of when the moving of the Holy Spirit is he's going to take over and we can't control him? And, uh, and I realized, because I, I really wanted to tell the worship leader, make sure you do that song Saturday night. That's such a cool song. Then I realized I had to go up to her and, and I said, don't do that song Saturday night. It's not scriptural. And we had an interesting talk about it. But God doesn't do things that, that put us out of control. And, and I often wish he would. I, you know, I'd love it. Just take me. I don't want to be in control. But then that takes away my choice and your choice, and, and our choices to follow his will are so very important to him. So what I've been observing lately is that many of us want the power, but we're not willing to pay the cost, or especially that part of cost that is repentance, that, that willingness to give up things that keep us from being all about him. And in light of this, these third and fourth chapters in Zechariah have just really grabbed my attention. While Zerubbabel, the civic leader or governor, was trying to motivate people who were discouraged and selfish, Joshua the priest was trying to address the obedience and the sin of the people. As priest, Joshua stood before the Lord as a representative of the people. In Zechariah 3, 8, in uh, New International, it says, Listen, O high priest Joshua, and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come, I'm going to bring my servant, the branch, speaking of Jesus. And we have in chapter 3 another courtroom-like setting. It says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. Joshua representing the people of Israel as the accused, and God the judge, Satan the accuser. See, it's much like that is what is happening still today as Satan stands before the Lord in heaven and he accuses you and me. we say, I've got no strength. Remember the, wooden the woman caught in adultery? Her accusers demanded judgment, and that's what Satan does. You know, he says, look at what she's done. What are you going to do about this, God? And, and so he's standing, Joshua representing the people, is standing before the Lord, and Satan is accusing him and the people. Look at what these people are, have done. What are you going to do about that? One day Satan will lose that access, but it won't happen until the time of the great tribulation. In Revelation 12:10, it says, Then I heard a loud voice 
saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. But that hasn't happened yet. Satan appears before God and he accuses you and he accuses me. Now, keep in mind when Satan talks about God to you and to me, he lies, doesn't he? But when he talks to God about you and me, he tells the truth. You know, look at what she did. He doesn't have to lie. He does not need to say more about us than is true or even exaggerate our sins. They're, they're bad enough all on their own. And Satan thinks you and I should have to pay for what we have done. So look at God's response in Zechariah 3, 2. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. The Lord who has chosen you and me when we get accused says, I rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire speaking of you and me? Amos 4.11 says, I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. We've been plucked, you know, saved from hell. And yet the people weren't appreciating it. They weren't living in appreciation of it, and it's a challenge to us. God had punished his people in the 70 years of captivity, and he and his choice in exhibiting his grace had delivered them from their fiery ordeal and the work that he promised to do in and through his people he would do. Psalm 89, verses 30 to 34. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgment, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break. My promises I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Satan's goal is to make us pay for our sins. After all, no grace was available to him and to the angels that chose to follow him, and he doesn't get why so much grace is available to us. Deuteronomy 7, 7, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage. God set his love on the people of Israel not because of any great thing they have done. And he has set his love on you and me, not because of any greatness, but because he loves us. And because the giving of his love is not based on our behavior, nor will he withdraw his love or his plan for us because of his disobedience. That's an incredible promise. Oh, how you and I need to be reminded of that truth, as did the people of Jerusalem. But see, God has to do something about our sins. See, Satan is right. Look at what she's done. But God has something that he has done. He can't just ignore our sins. So pay attention to the the next three verses in Zechariah 3, 3 to 5. Now Joshua was, was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Remember, this is a vision. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, take away the filthy garments from him. This is God's answer to Satan's accusation. Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. Now the filthy garments symbolize our sin. Joshua representing the people and really you and me also. He stood before the angel of the Lord in filthy garments, in his sin, guilty as he had been accused by Satan. 
See, it wasn't his guilt that was in, in question. You know, you're guilty, I'm guilty. But God's response was not, yes, he's guilty, he's filthy. His response was, take away the filthy garments and put upon him rich robes. Ezekiel 36, 25, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Isaiah 61, 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Our part, see, is not to take off the filthy clothes. Even if, even if we did, we wouldn't have righteous robes to, to put on ourselves after we took off the filthiness. If you and I could take off our stained clothes, we'd just be standing before the Lord naked. But then verse 5 in Zechariah 3, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. The high priest, as Joshua is representing himself, uh, wore a turban and this is, is a good likeness of it. And on this band that went around the turban, it says, holiness unto the Lord. And see, now you and I are high priests, and we, in a sense, wear this plate that says, holiness unto, unto the Lord, separated to the Lord for his purposes. And he said, put this turban, this clean turban, on his head. And the book of Hebrew it calls us priests now. And when God puts his rich robes on us, he does so with a purpose. We, we know Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But after we are saved, after, not before, after we are saved, comes verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so we have the words following God's cleansing, very similar to this, in Zechariah 3, 6, and 7. Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among those who stand there. So after he cleanses Joshua, then he says, and I love this last part, I will give you places to walk. You know, I love that. He cleanses us, and then he says to you and to me, now I'm going to give you places to go. I'm going to give you places to walk, things to do. Cleansing is based on faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ alone. <clears throat> Blessing. Blessing is based on our obedience, walking in his ways. And when we do, he gives us places to walk, good works to do, specific ones for each one of us. There's a little short-tailed weasel called the ermine, and he looks like this. He's a real cutie. This is what he looks like in the winter. He has this unique feature of having his fur changed to this snow white color. And he instinctively protects his white coat. He loves his white coat. And he protects it against anything that will soil it. And fur hunters know this about the ermine. And so they don't set traps for the ermine like they would another kind of an animal. They find his home, and it's usually a cleft in a rock or a, a hole in an old tree. And what they do is they find that, that hole, and then they just slather it with tar. And then they find the ermine, and they start chasing the ermine. And of course, the ermine goes back to its home. But when the ermine gets back to his home and sees this filth, it stops. It won't go in. And then that's when it is captured. And, and the point is the, the ermine 
sees holiness more important than happiness, even more important than his own safety. And what a challenge that is to us when, when God puts his turban on our head, you know, and says when we come to him, holiness unto the Lord. And these ermines wanted to protect their purity so much that they would die for it. And what about us? It's, it's just such a good example with these little guys. Our place is to, like the ermine, to protect that rich white coat of holiness that God has wrapped around us. And, and yes, we'll get it dirty. Yes, we'll do something dumb and we'll get a spot on it. But see, not a stain. Anyway, not a stain that, that God's forgiveness can't remove. At night in the upper room, Jesus washed the disciples' feet, remember? And uh, because the day-to-day stuff gets on our feet. And you and I make day-to-day choices because of the stuff that hits our lives. And so like the disciples, we need to be washed daily. We need to sit before the Lord's holiness daily. And we know that. See, my concern is, though, are we satisfied with just being that ermine with some dirty spots on us, you know? It's okay. It's good enough. Because I don't want to give up what makes that, that dirty spot. I don't really want to be white and pure before the Lord. The ermine wanted to be that way. See, are we okay with some things in our lives? Do we need a clean turban? today or maybe a fresh start or a fresh declaration to the Lord, you know, saying, I'm going to live a life that pursues and values holiness. See, do you, you see yourself as this ermine. I, I love this. And I took, it, this took me a lot of work to put this hat on this little guy. <laughs> but it says, take away the filthy garments from him. Let him put a clean turban on his head, and do we want to be like that, you know? Here I am, Lord, I want to be white and pure before you. You've put the hat. Remember, we don't put the hat on our head. We don't put the band on. He does. He puts it on you and me, holiness unto the Lord. And what does it look like under that hat for each one of us? This is just such an absolutely wonderful picture of the gospel. Joshua representing Israel and you and me, coming into God's presence with all of his guilt upon him. Remember the first time he did that? Maybe you didn't grasp the significance or the impact of that first time. Maybe it was later after the initial washing and forgiveness that you came to him more aware of the filthy clothes. But glory to God, even Every repentant soul can approach him knowing that we will find mercy and grace. I was reading recently in my devotions about the Day of Atonement. And remember, that was the one day of the year where the high priest could go into the very holiest of places and meet with God. And a commentator said, entering into God's presence had to be by invitation. And I like that, you know. Only the high priest could come. Only the high priest was invited by God to come. But because of Jesus, we know the veil's been torn, and we've been invited. It's our invitation. Come on in. And I want to add this to it. This I, I wrote in my devotions a few weeks ago. It was right after God slew Aaron's sons for not coming before him the way he had prescribed. They weren't honoring the priesthood. They were offering fire in a way that God told them not to. And in Aaron losing his sons, he was, of course, devastated. Leviticus 10.3 says, And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. See, we can come to God just as we are, but we can't come to him in our own way. Get that? We can come to him just as we are, but we can't come to him the way we feel like we can come to him. Remember, Cain tried it. Thought he could come to the Lord and offer grain when God says, no, I want want a meat sacrifice. 
And so we can come to him in our filthy garments, but we should come repentant and we should come realizing that promises to be good and to make up for what we've done wrong or excuses, it's not what God's looking for. He's looking for us to realize that the only way we can have rich robes is if he puts them on us because of Jesus. And our adversary continues to try to hinder that, but God won't listen to him. Yes, Satan's right. We're guilty, but he's wrong in expecting that God will punish. God's eye is on the lamb who takes away our sin. Isaiah 53, 12, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Satan accuses, Jesus intercedes. God likes what Jesus has to say. So you and I are to serve the Lord as to those whom God has plucked out of the fire. He didn't have to, but he did. And the realization of that, see, the realization of the grace and the forgiveness should cause us to pick up, in a sense, pick up the shovel and the pick and get to work, his work. That woman caught in adultery, she'd been caught in the act. Penalty was death. Her accusers demanded it. Satan demands that we pay, but instead Jesus forgave her. But see, after the forgiveness came the command, go and sin no more. So with us, after forgiveness comes a command. Part of confession is saying to the Lord, you are right about my life, I'm wrong. But lest we pick up our pick and shovel and start building in our own determination and strength, Zechariah was given words for Zerubbabel, the overseer of building the temple. And unlike chapter 3, where Zechariah saw Joshua, he didn't see Zerubbabel. Rather, he saw a lamp stand. The foundation of the temple had been laid. And then they quit for 15, 20 years. Haggai had come to wake them up from their wrong priorities, and they obeyed him and began to build. Five months into the rebuilding, the Lord gave Zechariah eight visions to encourage them. Now, here's a photo of current rubble in Gaza or in about 2014. And see, this is what they came back to. You know, this is not fun. This is not just leveled off land. Okay, let's start building the temple. Somebody's got to clean it all up. It's a mess. It, it truly is a, a mountain to look at that, to have that all cleaned up and then to start building with what had been set before them. Where do you start? See, before building, it takes a lot of cleanup. And cleaning up can be discouraging, can't it? And what happens when we try to do something in our own strength, whether it be a project or really much more difficult to walk in the way God commands us to do in as he did in Zechariah 3. We get discouraged because we start realizing that our, that our ambitions are fleeting, our strength is wavering, our discouragement is winning, and we just want to quit. And the Lord showed Zechariah a lampstand and asked the question, what do you see? As a counselor, that, that question gets my attention we would be wise to do it when circumstances of life overwhelm us, to just sit before the Lord and allow him to ask us that question. What do you see in the situation you are in right now? And a lot of times if we verbalize it, we can really see how silly we are. But how, how do we see what is happening to us? And so he says to Zechariah, what do you see? And for us, a lot of times it's like, well, I see it this way. I see it threatening me in this way. It's often profitable to hear ourselves. And Zachariah saw something very familiar in some ways yet very different. The different part he didn't get. He saw a lampstand much like the one that was in the temple, much like the one that the Lord was having the people make as the Babylonians has taken away the original one. 
a lampstand sheds light. Revelation 1.20 says, the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. And we as the temple of the Holy Spirit are God's lampstand. We're the light of the world. The power to shine the light was dependent on the oil though. And the lampstand of the temple was to shine perpetually. And the lampstand of the temple looked very much like this. And it was the job of the priests to make sure the light did not go out in that lampstand. But Zechariah's vision was different. This is the, the best I could find as, uh, as an illustration of what it might have looked like. Um, <laughs> really sadly this morning, and most of you know, I, I have a, a necklace that, that shows this, that depicts this, but um, I got new pants in New York. So my, my goal this morning was to find a necklace that matched my pants when God had a necklace that matched my message. Uh, and so uh, I was really bummed this morning when all of a sudden it hit me. It was like, oh, my lampstand necklace. I fell short. Mattress looks good, but see, that's what we do. We, we settle for so much less than what God would have for us. And it's so important to us to, to remember to seek him. So this vision of Zechariah had seven pipes of oil flowing into each of the seven bowls. That's 49 pipes. That's a lot of oil. All we need for anything that comes our way and for any calling of God on our lives, his oil, his anointing. And after Zechariah told the angel what he saw, he had a question for the angel. What are these? That's a good one for us to ask the Lord. So what are you doing in this? What do you want me to understand about what I see? He may not give us the whole picture, but Lord, what do you want me to get? How do you want me to respond with what has been set before me? And verse six gives us God's answer. We need to pay attention because this was not only God's provision for Zerubbabel, it was God's provision for you and me when we feel overwhelmed or if we are wise before we enter into doing any work for the Lord. And this is what I want you to tell Zerubbabel. The Lord said, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Again, says the Lord of hosts, the Lord who reigns over all powers and all principalities. And as was stated in your homework, uh, sometimes we focus on collective strength I think of that as looking to other resources, other answers, other ways to get it done. We look around, we look horizontally, and sometimes they're pretty good ways. They just aren't as good as God's ways. And then sometimes we, we focus on the power of our own individual strength, looking to our own resources, our own cleverness, our own abilities or strength. And God wanted Zechariah to tell Zerubbabel, that the temple would be built by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I thought about this a lot as I was preparing. When we trust in or look to our own resources, we don't enjoy the full supply of the Holy Spirit. Consider that phrase, full supply of the Spirit. I want a full supply of the Spirit. We still have to work, but the power, the ability has to come from the Holy Spirit. We know this, but how often do we settle for a partial supply of the Holy Spirit and look to our own resources for the rest? Like we only want the Holy Spirit to fill that gap. I can do this much, Lord, and, and here's what needs to be done. So, so just fill in this part right here. God wants us to seek a full supply of the Holy Spirit. And he wants to supply us continually. And I, I had to laugh at myself this morning because when I, when I saw all that hadn't been done, I was overwhelmed. And I was in a place where I knew, God, I, I can't, I can't do this in my own strength. 
and I prayed, and, and, and he really did kick in and help me to pull it all together. And I was texting a friend about it, and, and then I started to text, okay, it's not beyond me now. Do you see what I was saying? I got it now, Lord. You know, it was, and, and I stopped myself before I texted it because I thought, how ridiculous that is. Lord, kick in, do all you need. Okay, I got it. It's not beyond me now. This is doable now. That's what gets you and me into so much trouble. And verse 7 says, Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. The project of rebuilding the temple seemed like a mountain, impossible. They tried. It didn't work. They didn't have the resources that Solomon had. They, they looked at the splendor of Solomon's temple, and they, they, they didn't have the manpower. They didn't have the finances Solomon had. So what did they say? Can't do it. It's not doable. Solomon built his temple from a vast supply of resources, this temple would be different. Everyone would know when that capstone, that final stone was placed, that it was because of the grace of God. You know, to stand back and just go, grace, grace, grace did this. The mountain of impossibility would become a plain, something doable. Mountains and plains are the same to the Lord. Neither limits him or makes it easier for him. If we look at God's strength and not ours, we realize that mountains and plains are equally possible. God would give them a new perspective of the building of a temple. What seemed like a mountain, what seemed impossible, would be as a plain, would be doable in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 9 tells us the hands of Zerubbabel started the work and his hands would finish it. My verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, he who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. As God called, he will accomplish the work, and he's a finisher. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Our God finishes what he begins now, verse 10 poses an interesting question. For who has despised the small things? Nothing. Nothing God does is small. So are you disappointed in what God has done? You and I don't see the whole picture. And sometimes our viewpoint of what is happening may not be what we would like. We want bigger, we want better, we want more impressive. And we get to that place of, I've got no strength. What I have to offer seems so small. Remember Peter fishing all night long, doing what he thought he knew how to do, and it wasn't working. And Jesus told him what to do, this carpenter. And he says, but it didn't work. I've tried everything, I know what I'm doing. And then Peter said, but nevertheless, I will do what you've said. Obedience there. God rejoices in those words. Nevertheless, I'll, I'll pick up the pick and the shovel again. In Numbers 16, 9, I thought of this this morning, so it's not on the screen. God says to the people of Israel, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself? He's talking about the, the Levites. To do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, to stand before the congregation to serve them. See, the Levites, a lot of their job at that time was just to put all the temple, the tabernacle stuff together put, and, and carry it. And they got to that place sometimes, it was like, I, I want to do the, the really holy stuff, the priest stuff, you know? And, and God said to them, is it a small thing that I have separated you, you personally, to do this work for me? 
And, and what a challenge to you and me sometimes. I'm like, well, I don't want to do that. God says, is it, is it a small thing to you that I picked you to do that work? And this is what he's saying to the people here in Zechariah. For who has despised the day of small things? And then the rest of the verse for these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now, who are these seven? Verse 10 answers the question for us. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout the earth. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Okay, now. Right there, right there was my hit the floor moment as I prepared this message. I didn't see it till I got right here in the message. In what does God rejoice? He rejoiced in seeing the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. He rejoiced in seeing Zerubbabel doing the work God called him to do. See, yes, we must depend on the power of the Holy Spirit, but so we've got to do the work and depend on his power to enable us. God didn't get rid of the opposition. He didn't multiply the resources. He didn't change the problem. Zerubbabel still had the same obstacles and God didn't give him shortcuts. He didn't miraculously finish the work, but Zerubbabel pushed through and kept working relying on the Holy Spirit to get it done. And that made God rejoice. That made God happy. As verse 7 reveals, the people will shout, grace, grace to it, or grace did it. I, I don't know how to explain that. You know, how we put our all into something, but we depend on the Holy Spirit to empower us. But when we do that and look back, we know. And we say, grace, grace, he did it. And someone would, you know, that doesn't know the Lord well would go, no, no, you worked really hard. You did that. But you and I know, no, no, God did it. I picked up my pick and my shovel, and God did it. Grace, grace. Probably familiar with the song, I did it my way. It's such an empty song. The most fulfilling feeling is God did it his way and I got to be the vessel. And not only is it a fulfilling reason for rejoicing for us, when we look to God to work in and through us and we pick up the pick and shovel, God rejoices. God rejoices when we do that. Now, what can we or what should we look to for the Holy Spirit to do in our lives? and, and because of time, I'm just going to give you the, the verse, and now I'm going to read it. Um, but you'll probably want to take pictures. Okay, the role of the Holy Spirit, he gives you what to say. Luke 12, 12 says, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. He teaches, John 14, 26, and 1 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. They didn't get so much of what Jesus said to them, but he put it in and he put it in. And sometimes we don't get what the word of God is saying to us, but we put it in and then the Holy Spirit, you know how he gets in there and he gives understanding to something. He brings something to our remembrance he guides in all truth, John 16, 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you in all truth. What a promise, don't we need that? And, and this is look to the Holy Spirit. He will guide us in all truth. He gives power, Acts 1, 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I, I love to think of that, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the coming upon of the Holy Spirit, of that, that dripping 
of the Holy Spirit that we read about in Zechariah. And then he gives spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. To each one is given a spiritual gift. He comforts. This is what he does. This is what we miss out on if we don't look to him. Acts 9, 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. He pours love into our hearts, Romans 5, 5. Now hope does not disappoint because of the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has, who was given to us. Only believers that have the Holy Spirit can have a hope that does not disappoint. He helps in our weaknesses. Romans 8, 26 and 27, likewise the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He transforms us, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18. Now the Lord is spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord are, are being transformed, present tense, into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. He strengthens the inner man, Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. And he produces fruit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit, the result of the Spirit working in our lives is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Comes only, not by us buckling up and being good and being determined to be kind and gentle, but by the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And Zachariah had yet another question, and I like to think that maybe he didn't notice it before. Maybe it was not until he had looked for a while that he saw more and wanted to know more. So we see in verses 11 and 12, then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees at the right hand, or the right of the lampstand, and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains. And the answer, verse 14, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Now we have here a near fulfillment of prophecy and yet a prediction, a prophecy of a future fulfillment. The near, these two anointed ones, would be Joshua and Zerubbabel, who stood before the Lord for the power. Future fulfillment we see in Revelation 11 when we see the two witnesses are revealed. And here's what they will do in Revelation 11:3. It says, I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days, three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. And this is how God identified them. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Two very different callings, but the same thing. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. And when God calls, no matter what the calling, we've got to remember, not by our might, not by our power, but by his spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And they would prophesy for three and a half years, no one could harm them as much as they wanted to. No one could stop them until God's chosen time. And as verse 7 says in uh, 
Revelation 11, when their testimony was finished. Then the beast overcame them and killed them. But in three days, God would raise them up. See, I'm a wick. That's all I am. You're a wick. How can a wick, a little wick, ever hope to be a supply of light? If, if someone just took a wick and showed you, okay, this is going to be a light, you'd say, no way. But see, that's all we are. And then when God dips his oil and drains his oil on you and me and lights us, we're a flame for him. But we got to remember, all we are is a wick. And the oil burns better on a clean wick. Candle people know that. You know, they, they scrape the, the whip. They clean it. And God knows he needs to do that first before he pours the oil and sets the wick on fire. So before we burn, we need cleansing. We need to seek cleansing. Then let us pick up the pick and the shovel and do that which causes the Lord to rejoice, doing his work in his power. Let's pray. Father, uh, Lord, I, I pray that for each of us, we would just have a renewed sense that you have a place for us to walk. You have works for us to do that you have ordained specific works for each one of us as we walk in this life and may we not despise the small things because nothing you call us to do is small when we're all doing everything we're called to do it fits and it works and and your big goal gets accomplished the temple gets built and you are honored and so father for each of us may we stop looking to ourselves whether we think we are great or so weak. May we not look to that, but may we look to you and just pick up our pick and shovel. And Lord, thank you that in doing so, we can actually make the Lord of hosts smile. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we can fall short in one of two ways in, in God working through us. Uh, one is lack of confidence and thinking we can't do it. And the other is overconfidence and, and thinking we can. And a lot of times I probably fall short in the, the latter. I'm really independent and I get a great sense of satisfaction doing something all by myself. And uh, uh, Dale is the team player, loves to do everything with me. and. And one time he was putting up a uh, tent and we just bought it and, and he said, come over here and help me. And, and I said to him, try to do it by yourself because it'll feel so good when you get it done. And so he got the instructions out and put it up and he said, okay, it's done. And I said, doesn't that feel good? And he said, no, we could have done it together. And see, the Lord says that to you and to me, no matter whether we feel uh, unable or too able, he wants to do it with us. You know, he says, here's what I want to do. Here the, here's the project set before you. Pick up your pick and your shovel, and let's build this thing. And, and may you be inspired, whether you fall short one way or the other. May you know that the funnest thing is when God says, we did it together. And you, you know, Lord, you and I did this. Grace, grace. It's the best. So don't miss out on that. Anything God is calling you to do, Step out and watch him work. God bless you girls.